No, um, Jessica, I mean, can, you tell, can you tell Anne that you're going to be doing tomorrow? And what I'm going to do, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just, I'll just get this on YouTube and I'll, 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 I'll sign off. So, um, it's, it's, it's already on YouTube now. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So, so I tell you, what, let, give, give me, a, give me a minute or so to um, get everything sorted out on there, and we'll, we'll, we'll um, I'll, I'll, over to you anyway. All right, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, and tomorrow, um, basically, um, with technical issues, I just thought it would be easier if I got got down to you guys. Um, so I'm going over to West Wales tomorrow. Uh, no, Friday, just to help out with Carl. Um, oh, right. Okay. But and I, I, I thought it would be easier to sort that out. So I've got you guys tomorrow in person. Um, so I've told Del... Um, i got to try and yeah, get hold of Bill. Bill. Bill is coming. Bill is coming. Oh, tomorrow. he knows, does he? Yeah, I told him. Oh, you. perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Kat. Um, um. Um, <laughs> just having one of those days. No, yeah. I, I think land to it, half of them possibly know that I'm going. Some of them don't. And so that's going to be a nice surprise, I think, for them. A um, little bit of a shock, possibly. Um, yeah. But I, I, it's I, a I, shame. I, I feel like this storm has really affected all these plans. And... Mm. Yeah. Oh, but I can't wait to go down there and see Carl on Friday instead. Yeah, so uh, it's going to be nice weather, according. Well, it should be. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I brought extra clothes. It's going to be clothes. nice weather, so it will be. <laughs> I'm wrapping up warm, putting extra layers on. It'll I think. Be cold, yeah. Yeah. It'll be cold, but dry. Yeah, mm. I prefer that, and hopefully go for a nice walk. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, um, Anne, is there any news that you have this week? Um, oh, I can't can't think. <laughs> can't think at the moment. But um, there there has been news, but um, I probably forgotten it. Knowing me, yeah. <laughs> no, that's fine, Anne. I don't actually have much news this week, so uh, that's a first for me. Uh-huh. Um, mm-hmm. <coughs> But I, I'm sure, um, Richard, you have any news? I'll quickly look on uh, my feed. But Richard, do you have any news? Yeah, no, not really. I did see that with the um, on the Isle of Sky. Oh yes, that the, bird. Uh, yeah, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, where's the one that I saw the other day? Um, oh, see, the, the thing is, I have them suggested to me all the time. I, I, I am convinced it looks at my. Um, for example, my laptop will have different suggestions. It's more specific to history and archaeology because this is what I use for work and to study. But my Google on my phone, for example, or on my uh, iPad, it just goes all funny. It, 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 it's, it's a little bit of history and archaeology. Then it'll be some um, other stuff. So what, I, what I'll do, I found one that I did post the other day. So it was a they have this new analysis um, going on at the moment that's just got into the news. Um, 3,000 and 200 year old lead ingots um, that basically have brought, synced lots of theories that were about the Bronze Age trade. Um, so they found this um, in uh, Cyprus, I believe. Yes, it was Cyprus. Um, and it was part of a, um, of a, a shipwreck. And they've looked at it more in a, in detail. And it's absolutely right. fantastic because it just tells you more about, I think, the late Bronze Age period. And um, it, it was found in dives in the 1980s. I, was, I'm, I think we have talked about this um, beforehand. Um, but it's definitely interesting if you can have a look at it. Um, it's this oh. detective story. Um, hang on, I'm going to just answer Carl's um, messages on here. Um, yes, Carl, I will bring wellies. And I'm a size five um shoe size um so yeah it, it's quite oh, interesting yeah. this is in the times of israel for some strange reason but there you go what what was you going to yeah, say Anne? there was um a pair of uh, wooden uh uh the wooden figures in in a boat with a serpent's head and it was found they thought it was like um a token you know um it was bronze, uh, early Iron Age or mm. late Bronze Age, and uh, they thought it was like um, an offering, you know, to the to the gods, you know, because it was found in water. Yeah, in, in Yorkshire, 
Uh, oh, it's fantastic. It had stone eyes. And I, I put it online, but um, I don't know if anyone's seen it. But um, Oh, no, I'll have a look at that, Anne. That sounds interesting. Someone, someone came on, which was great, who was on the Bridgend Archaeology Cymru group. <coughs> and they came on and they had um, some bronze coins that were found um, in the late Iron Age. And they also had the boat with the serpent's head. And oh wow! Figures and and it seems like it's a motif, like sailors or something. Oh, so it's quite interesting that little connection. So it made yeah. me look up the hoard. <laughs> oh, I'll have the a look hoard. for that, and that sounds yeah. really interesting. Yeah, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Oh, a hundred percent. I think that's absolutely yeah. fantastic. Okay. Um. And I got one final piece of news, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, basically, archaeologists are set to um, excavate this Iron Age settlement that had sacrificial dog burials in there for possibly prosperity um, or, or possibly luck. But there was roundhouses in it that they're going to um, excavate made of earth and timber, and they had a thatched uh, cone roof on top of it. Um, but they found over 5,000 artefacts so far. Um, they've even found um, carved antler items, um, obviously these sacrificial dog burials, um, fragmented human remains, and um, 10 domestic structures so that'd be quite interesting to see if there's more coming out of it um, and possibly have a discussion on that because that sounds really interesting and they've already provided images already which are absolutely yeah. fantastic um, and especially finding that m amount of archaeology is, is the mother load really so hopefully we'll have more information we can have a talk about that um, if you guys like so when um, what I'll do, I'll get into today. Um, I do warn, I'm not sure what's going on with the PowerPoint, but it, it's been not having a good day with me. So if there's something missing, images or text or, or, or even a slide, um, I'm just going to just carry on with it and hopefully I can fill in the gaps, which I normally do if there's a, a gap because uh, I, I really hate technology. It's not my... Uh, friend um i remember doing a i had to do this compulsory um it was like a certificate this course for um a very basic it level in technology and it was oh i hated it so much i remember turning up to the lesson all the time and just sort of going off into the little dreamland that i had <laughs> in my head and um, wishing for it to be over but I, I learned nothing from it. I, everything that I know is from my own personal experience. So we'll get into today. Um, so uh, Bronze Age kissed um, burials and we'll be looking at uh, Park Sibby, uh, which is in North Wales, um, which um, has uh, a Bronze Age kissed burial, but also has um, two settlements that I just wanted to quickly touch upon as well. Um, but I, I think uh, we'll, we'll be looking at an example in England and then one in Wales and just see how different they are. Um, only slightly um, could possibly just mean different rituals or ceremonies or could be different based on the individual. Um, but I think they're, they're very interesting to look at, especially the one in Wales. Um, so if I just quickly get my notes up, I just realise it's just turned off. Um, again, going back to the tech, every time I go on to Google Docs at the moment, I'll be on there for a few minutes and it kicks me off. So, um, where's my file? So, um, got my stuff, so happy happy days um so i think that what we see with bronze age kiss burials that, that what i mean by producing different pieces of evidence um that this this can tell us different practices possibly maybe different things about the individual um and it could just relate to the location uh, within britain that this is um so like I said, we'll look at one example from England and one from Wales, um, but we could compare them possibly. Um, but I think one thing that I like to do is just appreciate the archaeology from each site rather than compare, um, because to me, everything, I love it. Um, if my laptop wants to work, I still sound a little bit bunged up, but I'm much better than what I was last yeah. week. Um, uh, it's fine, and I just sound really odd, but... This has been described, this, oh, I think I've gone back um, 
a little bit. Yeah, there is. Um, yes. So I, I, I was thinking about just quickly for anyone that, that could be watching online and um, Richard, I have everything that so you probably know what I'm talking about, but I just thought if we just recap the, the basics, because um, I'm one of those people that um, if something like this would be brought up, um, I would have to know about it if I didn't. So uh, if this is for anyone online, um, if this uh, is sent out. Um, so a kissed burial, um, which is also called um, a stone chest as well, some people have that name for it, but is a prehistoric European coffin that would contain um, a body or ashes um, and it would be made out of a stone or, a, or possibly a hollowed out tree. Um, and it'd be a, it could be a storage place as well for sacrificial objects or, like I said, something that could relate to the individual. Um, but is it a case has been more of a general term to refer to this um, because it's just easier and I think it's easier just to agree on one term so you don't get too confused with it. Um, but it would be put up onto um, a mound as well. And you, and you find some right interesting ones um, when you go out and about Cornwall has some interesting ones. Um, and you can read about them online. Um, that book that I has, what was in hidden histories? Um, so we were just walking around Britain's landscape, um, and it brings out little things. They they have a section on that which is absolutely fantastic. Um, but it, it, pe people look at this and see this is a very unique way of uh, saying goodbye to a loved one. And I think the effort that it would make to create something like this as well um, just shows that there was a lot of care or maybe that individual was really important. Um, and I th th was finding some of these, they're, they're absolutely gorgeous. I remember going to Cornwall and there was one where they flattened the top of it and basically let a road go over it. And it, it just thought, it's crazy how it still survives and it's even survived the roads going over it and it's still there for us to marvel over today. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, you can find a lot of these um, around um, Britain. And I think it's just very unique. Obviously, it's a European thing, but it's also very unique to us. Um, so I, I don't really like to see things as possibly, because when people mention offerings and offerings are mentioned with this, I think a lot of people go down this route of possibly a God being involved or um, something magical, but it could be um, offerings as well to the individual to possibly help them with the afterlife or um, just to keep food with them. I'm not sure. I was just thinking out the box because, um, it, it, again, it, 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 why does it always have to be something to do with uh, religion? Um, so one thing I thought I'd do first is to talk about uh, White Horse Hill. Um, this is um, a fantastic um, site which has a lot of um, archaeology and information around there. So you can look on lots of sites and lots of articles and they will talk a, a lot about the ins and outs of this and why this is a special place. It has been described online as an internationally um, important Bronze Age cyst. And so it, it does make you wonder what, what's so special about it. And you can see here that this individual is actually um, measuring it out and it's kind of collapsed a little bit on top. Um, but this is a, a, a site that would have, hang on, I think that photo that, that we have an image of, I've, this is what I mean. Hang on, let me press escape. I think that image that we have a photo of, yeah, it's meant to be in that one. So if I just quickly copy, delete it from there, because I don't want to kind of cloud your um, thoughts on all of this and quickly add it onto here. There, perfect. Anyway, we'll go back to where we were um, from the current slide. So um, this has been described as a... Um, internationally important Bronze Age um, kist and I, I, I agree um, because look at how fantastic that is it was only uh, one of them and we'll definitely see how the Welsh example has quite a few um, but this was um, talked about um, in 2016 and this was an early Bronze Age kist so um, uh, we see them from all throughout the ages of the Bronze Age period, um, and I think it's definitely unique. And you can see, um, you can see it more on uh, the images 
because there's also been, um, this was found in 2011, the excavation, they brought it out information in 2016. But if I bring out um, a pen, um, this area is, is, is a very dark soil as well. Um, and that was something they actually um, counted for in their investigations when they were marking it out. Um, again, soil can tell you a, a lot. Um, and there was also a theory that these um, capstones, and like, like I already thought, that they collapsed, that possibly they could have been a little bit further up um, that way and more straight across. Um, but it is still in fantastic condition mm. and a great find as well. And this was found uh, uh, with, this is an image that's been held by the archaeological unit in Cornwall, because this is in Dartmoor, so it's not far. And I remember we went to Dartmoor and we saw some fantastic archaeology on the way to Cornwall as well. It felt really magical. Um, so there was um, records by antiquitarians in the... Um, 1800s there was talking about these kists on Dartmoor um, and they had this um, curiosity um, which would be rewarded with a flint tool and if they were very lucky a pot um, but more often than not their endeavours that they had were never met and they, they, they found just an empty cavity so um, when an eroding kist was exposed on Whitehorse Hill um, it's, it's prompted an excavation in 2011 because they knew that there was records of something going on here. So when some, when one was showing through erosion, this is when archaeologists definitely thought they should jump onto this. Um, and I think it was a very good decision. Um, and the content of this was unremarkable as well. So um, this was shining a light on um, burials in early Bronze Age Dartmoor and um, you have individuals such as Andy Jones and Matthew Simmons that are talking about this and investigating this. Um, so you could easily uh, mistake uh, this site for um, a barrow from a distance. But this ground that held the burial for almost 3,000 years stands proud of the surrounding hilltop and rises to form an appreciable mound. And I think one thing that I will say about this is that the, the, it's, it's almost like it's looking down at the landscape um, and sort of being the highest that it can be. Um, the, the, this is the final stage in life, but I could be looking more into it. Um, so um, in the 19th century, the 1800s labourers were stripping away the peat that blanketed, blanketed the hill for fuel and it was leaving only a few isolated um, stacks or hags, as they're also known, um, standing in their way. Um, it was a decision to spare one sack um, near the summit of the hill, which was able to preserve um, this, uh, this high cyst burial, um, which is currently known on Whitehorse Hill. Um, this this was absolutely fantastic that, that how this can happen with chance and I think this is something that we see with archaeology is chance when something is protected or is chanced when it's not been damaged um, but this is absolutely fantastic um, and I think it, it's nice that we have a story of this, a history already um, so th th there, there is a, a, a definitely discussion about whether um, these peat cutters um, whether they knew to avoid this spot or whether it was just um, chance. I personally think that it was chance. Um, but there was a discussion about um, how in the uh, 19th century, these peat cutters discussed how they found this telltale jumble of stones that were protruding out of the west face of the hag. Um, and they basically brought an antiquitarian with them that noticed a little bit on the hill and it was left at that um, and I think that's why they um, left it which I think is, is a good opportunity I think we always go back to the 1800s and give them a hard time about how they were too quick to excavate um, because of that we've lost archaeology because their methodology possibly um, misinterpretation um, but I think here the fact that they left it um, was a good choice because um, it left us to actually invest it properly in the future um, but again could be looking more into it but there is uh, talks of that um, and 
basically, as we get to the 1990s, the, these visible stones were being recorded um, and Historic England decided to do some work there in 2005. Um, but it was clear by 2011 um, that the hag was shrinking at a very alarming rate due to erosion, um, of the peat drying out, um, and also an exposed location from the wind. And so they decided to excavate this kist, um, which was vital um, to ensure that they had um, ar some archaeology. So if I... Um, oh, if I have a look at this. Um, yeah, so one thing as well that I wanted to mention is the sex of this individual was not determined. Um, the sex of this individual um, is determined through things which, um, again, if we're going to look at the Pavilan, the Red Lady of Pavilan, um, that wasn't a lady. Um, Buckland believed that it was a woman based on the fact that the individual was buried with jewellery. And what they've done here is that they think that this is possibly a woman because of the jewellery. It is debated. Um, I think jewellery, um, it doesn't matter. It, doesn't, it just depends on the fashion of the time period. Um, and we've made that mistake before in the past. And it seems that we don't learn how um, this jewellery could mean a woman that it could mean that is also a male um but a lot of people said that this jewelry was very um it, it it was very common for women in this period so if i just quickly get to the fantastic finds they found here um and then move on uh throughout the rest of it um so it was thought that the, the kist would be empty, according to the principal archaeologist with the Cornwall Archaeological Trust. His name is Andy Jones. He took undertook these excavations. Um, he said that, that it would fit with the known examples of Dartmoor, um, that they would be empty. And the kist was recorded and it looked like there was just one side stone left in place. Um, the base stone seemed to be sticking out in open air beyond the peat mound which suggested that almost all of the kist had been lost. So there was an assumption not only would there be nothing left inside because of the erosion and the conditions, but there would be very little left um, behind. Um, but they decided to obviously investigate. Um, and they found this um, base stone with a side stone that had slipped out of position. And the contents of the kist were intact behind it. So it was the way that um, these here um were able to uh, fall in as well like that also protected the archaeology that was inside again just full of luck um so they had gone up uh, so after they did all of this they find uh, they found all of this so what we're seeing in this image i shouldn't have got rid of the pen this image here um this is the cremated um the cremated bone and bear skin pelt from the uh, kist, which is also uh, revealed by the Wiltshire Conversion Centre. And it was Helen Williams that gave permission for this to be used. Um, it was one of those um, classic uh, late, uh, late, uh, late in the day scenarios where they, they were just basically thinking that they were finished with it. They thought they were about to end their investigation they find they found more artifacts which are fantastic um and they found that they, it looked possibly like there was some fur it's not a very good image but they said they could see that there was some fur on this um and there was a bone line underneath it so they decided not to dig in that field and um, they cut it out they wrapped it in cling film um and it was sent to the laboratory as i said to helen williams who was the one that was looking into this they didn't realize how rich this burial was going to be um i think it was just a shock they were just expecting this to be empty and um, very mundane but it wasn't it was proven to be something fantastic um so um this helen williams is carrying out a micro excavation and was sampling um that first find that they had there so um it was a very painstaking approach that has been described to investigating this case in the laboratory and also in the field as well um, there was lots of grave goods as well that was being found in the kiss, which sort of showed how there was a lot of deliberation that had gone into this burial, a lot of thought this individual meant a lot. Um, so they decided to have this response, have those 
responsible for the dig, uh, being the only ones who was digging it um, because they felt like this needed a lot of care. Um, so they basically had a look at all the um, land around it as well, trying to see if there was anything else. But they found that there was also um, a fantastic grave marker, which was this bear skin. Um, and it, they, they're not sure whether more was added to it. They hadn't really discussed it. But the radiocarbon data that they were able to have from that burial, for example, and its contents was um, 1,750 to 1,600 years ago. Um, and sorry, that's the wrong date. BC, sorry, a um, little bit tired. Um, so there was a lot of precision as well with what was being put onto here, a lot of, um, especially on the base stone as well. Um, and I think that is one of the best things about the site is looking at this bit of skin as well, how they were able to um, honour that person in some sort of way. But they're also talking about how um, grasses were collected um, from the moor. And they said there was a lot of purple moor grasses. Um, so they, they saw how this was put on top as well. They put a lot of force into this. Um, and they found that there was a presence of pollen as well from um, meadow sweet flowers that were picked in the late summer or, or early autumn of the time. Um, so they must have looked really pretty. And they found nettle and animal skin items as well. And there was also a, a sash that was placed over the grass. So they really put a lot of thought into this burial and it's definitely fantastic. Um, and they even found um, an, a bead necklace, which we can see in that image here as well. This is the bead necklace. Um, and they found a pair of two pairs of wooden studs here um, that we're looking at. Um, and they also found a, a bracelet and a flint flake and two pairs, like I said, oh, sorry, two pairs of uh, wooden studs. And they also found a pin that would have possibly fill, fixed the pelt closed as well. This is absolutely fantastic. And um, the bones were cremated as well. Um, but they think that the individual of these cremated bones were about 15 to 25. Um, but again, like I said, we weren't able to find out the sex. But it's very rich. Um, and I, I'm getting a suggestion here from those uh, studs that this would have been something where someone was stretching their ears. So could have told you more about the style and the fashion of the time and um, what possibly if it was a woman, what they had worn um, in their ears in terms of modifications as well as jewellery. So I thought that was quite interesting. A lot of thought has gone into that as well. Um, and clearly this individual um, was very important to everyone around. But this individual was not cremated um, on the spot. This was something that was um, brought up to the hilltop. Um, but there was it's absolutely fantastic the things that they were able to find. They've even brought illustrations. Um, and they also found that there was some a, a cattle hair bracelet that was um, put into this. It was worn on the wrist um, or possibly the upper arm. Um, and this was very... Uh, uh, interesting just seeing all of this the textiles um the, the the way that they were able to incorporate lots of things so when and i think one thing we find with these case burials is that we have different pieces of evidence um, and i think white horse hill is definitely a fantastic one um to look at um they, they, they have definitely found out that these antiquitarians were clearly um discussing something um and something that they decided to keep um keep an eye out for in the future which is absolutely fantastic so if i move on to the next uh, side slide um so we get to this next site which i thought was absolutely interesting to um read about really um and this park city i think this is how you say it in hollyhead um so the, the, these are these kists that are being excavated. Um, basically, there was a more modern um, cemetery that was put on top of this as well, um, which is clearly um, no longer there. Um, but as you can see from this first image, it was a circular formation and they had all these individuals. So um, this is not just one individual like the one that we saw. This is clearly um, a family or possibly a community that would have um, buried their past loved ones um, in this. So I, I thought it was quite interesting. Um, there is a connection with other prehistoric sites. Thinking uh, the Timau at Standing Stone and the Trigaf, uh, Trig 
Fignaf, or whatever, an awful at Welsh words, um, for the burial chamber nearby as well. Um, and I thought we could also look at them in a future um, discussion. I think we should look at Park City as a whole. I have a few um, excavation reports as well um, that I want to look at because there were some things that were being discussed and just had really no general relevance into what we were focusing on today. So I thought that's definitely something to do um, for another time. I'm just currently reading through all the excavation reports. It's quite interesting um, because there is one report that's been made public where they were basically putting all of the sites in a in an order of importance or something like that, or, or a priority to be protected. Um, and it, it's just interesting. This was one of the sites that was definitely seen to be important and they had to excavate on it. Um, this quite a little bit of information online, um, general online, but it's the articles that you need to find for all of this. Um, but it's definitely fantastic. There is a threat of urban development in this area. Um, Archaeology in Wales have also done a report. Um, we also see, Cadio actually hasn't done a report on any of this. Um, all these reports have been from different um, organisations. But it's thought to uh, keep a family in there and maybe keep them together even after death. So this was in the, the, the Beaker period. So this is 2500 to 2000 BC. Um, a lot of people also talk about this being a Bronze Age. Um, so th this is that new burials were introduced. So possibly individuals in these square stone chambers, which we see, um, oh, it's not in that image, unfortunately. I thought I had it. There you go. Um, quickly, that's it, where it is there. Um, that's stone chamber um absolutely fantastic information that is coming from this as well but this is um a tradition as well that's been brought into um the early bronze age so a lot of discussions talk about this being the beaker period um but this is just one set of notes i know that a lot of articles that i talk about call this the early bronze age was on that cusp um, but there is a threat of this urban development in this area. This is why they've had this report to possibly put everything in, in the area um, in a list of importance, what to excavate. Um, and this is definitely an interesting site because it's got a lot of connections with other things that have been found um, nearby. Um, and this was also um, released into the media um, in 2020, so they're still finding some more information on this, which is quite interesting. Um, it's not as rich as Whitehorse Hill with all this archaeology here. It's rich in another sense. It tells us a different story, and I think this is what I was trying to say here, is that Wales is so promising for its archaeology and history, and it, it, it can be on the same par as England, but it gives us a fresh perspective, a new perspective, and I think that's what I like, and I think this is why we need more for 10 in Welsh archaeology because of the difference in perspectives and how that can reveal more to us sometimes. So um, I was having a look at all of the information here. Um, they found um, a treasure trove of, um, of artefacts that were found um, th way before um, 2020. So um, they found them in 2010 um, and they've been excavating it right up until 2020 and they released it then. But it's on um, display now if you need to have a look. But it seems like they keep going back to this site. So this is a site that is being kept open for um, further investigation, um, which is absolutely um, fantastic and even um, encouraging to hear. So they have even said that this is international importance. See how we have with the White Horse Hill, I said here that it was internationally important. Um, it, it, ever, I think everyone wants that uh, title on their site, but it has shown how this is internationally important because it's also shown how people lived on Anglesey, um, possibly uh, 5,000 years ago. Um, so archaeologists working um, here on this island uncovered a treasure trove of artefacts um, and it was also dating um, through a range of periods so, so they think that this wasn't just one set period they don't think these individuals were buried at the same time they even found a neolithic timber hall that was there um 6, years old um, and also a 2400 year old iron age village um, and also this uh bronze age burial site where these stone chambers were found um, and Gwynedd Archaeological Trust has also um, been excavating this 20-acre site as well for um, a very long number of years. And I think it's interesting because we're finding a lot of archaeology that's reflecting 
um, a lot of time periods, a lot of different um, aspects of life in this period. And I think it's definitely an inter internationally important area. So one of the uh, um, interesting um, artefacts that they found as well, um, that's been found nearby to this burial site. It has no connection with this burial site, but it's, it's important as well as this Neolithic lead-like bead, um, which is thought to have come from Wales and is believed to be around about 5,700 years old. And um, so get, getting closer to this burial um, that would have been made. But for the first time, archaeologists are able to hold this five-week exhibition of their finding as well um, and also show how this area has changed throughout time and how we can learn so much from it. Um, so what we're seeing here um, is, is definitely a fantastic and interesting site um, and this is the images. So I told you there was going to be a few issues with the uh, PowerPoint. There was more written to this, but it's fine. I'll talk it to you instead. Um, so you can see here that there is a pot um, that's um, <coughs> that's being held there um, by these stone slabs. Um, and I think if, for what it is, um, the fact that we're not having the same amount of grave goods as the Englishman, I think is very interesting um, because the pottery has shown us different patterns. And I think this is a start of um, pottery being um, sort of uh, sophisticated in terms of the way they make this very polished and putting these designs on there, making their mark, I think, creating an identity possibly to the area where this would have come from. And I think pottery is very important in a way of showing things off. So clearly for this pottery to be that beautifully decorated, this individual meant a lot as well. Um, and they found with two of the pots that they had found um, out of um, quite a few that they found, I think there was about um, four or possibly six they found, but two of them contained um, uh, dairy products um, in, inside the vessels, which were shown by analysis and they were able to find the residue on this pottery. Um, but they, they fantastically preserved these pots. You can see in the uh, top right hand corner how beautifully preserved that is. And you can see which one that was. And um, the one that's in the top right hand corner uh, matches with the one in the bottom left hand corner. Uh, right by there so I think that's absolutely fantastic that I was able to find a photo of both of them as well because um, it's sometimes it's frustrating to look at sketches you want to see the actual thing um, and there's a lot of details and I think it, it's definitely showing how our ancestors lived in this area and it went from this it went from uh, an ordinary settlement that we'll look at soon into this religious burial area. And we have archaeology here that's going right up to 6,000 years ago to present. And um, we'll talk further into um, the settlement that's also described as internationally important. So if I have a look quickly, my notes have gone off again. Um, I'm going to strangle my phone. So if I go on this again... Find the document. No, that's not what I... I've got it here. Um, so, yes, it's, it's definitely an interesting one. And when you have a look at um, some of the information that you can find online, you can find some fantastic images. Um, but th there was five large... Uh, kissed burials and there was three small ones um, and it's probably like I said a family that was here um, a cemetery that would possibly would have had children as well as adults here um, and the layout of the graves suggests they were probably covered by a circular um, circular a single circular mound so if I can get on to uh, get rid of that oh um, like I said here it's, it's cut off in the image a little bit um, but in a circular mound so you can see how there's different sizes into each one of them and they think that the smaller ones could have represented children um and there was no trace that survived of this uh circular mound, mound of course this was just something that they'd found um based on some evidence they found with obviously lidar imagery and also seeing it protruding from the ground and um, like i said the, the, there's two burials here contained the dairy products if I can mark them off here it was this one here and it was that one here they were the ones that were containing the uh, dairy products 
Um, and they have produced those fantastic pieces of pottery that I have shown you in the Everscreen. Um, if my laptop wants to let me go, there you go. Um, but I think it's absolutely fantastic when you see this. There's lots of blogs, there's lots of historians that are talking about this as well. And I think it's definitely interesting. I think if we had a lecture um, or a class sort of dedicated to this area, because there is even late, a late Roman cemetery that's been uh, found on this site, and they even have lots of information. There's providing lots of information in terms of why these, these areas are really significantly important to our understanding. Um, and we'll move on to the settlements now. So this is one of the settlements they have. There was another settlement that was represented. I don't know where that's gone, but typical. Um, so if we get into um, this part now, so this is thought to be the uh, Neolithic um, example of the settlement that lived nearby. Um, so if I could find when there is on that part of my notes. So... Um, Basically, this area, like I said, it went from this uh, this settlement area to a religiously important burial area. Um, I don't know whether I agree with possibly religious being there, possibly um, the offerings could have been something that was just thought to be associated with that person to help them along their way. But the archaeology is dating back to 6,000 years ago. So one of the uh, more important sites here is this rectangle timber, timber structure it was around about 15 metres long. Um, so this timber hall dates back to 3700 BC. Um, so this is the early Neolithic period where farming and pottery is first being produced. And I think it's quite interesting. We normally see circular uh, structures here. And we definitely see in terms of the Iron Age one, there are circular structures. Um, but it's, it's interesting because we always think of these um, rectangular timber structures being from um, the Roman era, mm. um, not the Neolithic. This is what they're finding evidence of. Um, and this is where they this is their reconstruction of it. So obviously, um, I think what we can see here in the image, I've, I always laugh at these recreations. Um, don't know whether they go through all the hassle that they have the house and it just seems a... Uh, the, the, the heads on the walls is no uh, inclination that there was a skull that would have been part of that you can see how they're farming as well they're creating uh, stone tools here and um, they're cooking by here and um, I think you've got ch two children fighting there and um, you have the animals all around them as well um, and it definitely looks like a very um, idyllic uh, place to find but this is where they found uh, also this large bead um, that was made of uh, cannel coal which is a coal that was is jet and dark, jet black, um, and is a semi-precious stone as well that you get in Whitby. But um, it was never finished as stone, and it dates back to the early Neolithic period. And um, they think that this was made by the people that lived in this um, timber house. Um, but it was also, uh, it, it could have been lost outside, so it could have been dropped by them. Um, so this bead that I talked about that was close to the burial has a connection to this site, possibly, which is absolutely fantastic. How it's all relating to each other. Um, I don't know whether any of you can see, but I've, I've got the image here of the bead. Um, so if I try and get it, get it to enlarge on my phone... Um, that's not what I want to happen. Maybe if I click that, right, okay. If I click that, I'm going to stop share for a minute so I can show you the uh, bead in question that's been related to these burials, but that's the beads there. Um, yeah. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. This is what they were able to find. This is 5,700 years old, so it, it's, it's pretty old and is absolutely mm. fantastic as well that we're able to connect it. Um, but again, this is the earliest one in uh, Wales as well to be found. Um, and I think this is, a, to me, this is my favourite find, um, that bead as well as the uh, burial. But I think the bead is just so unusual um, and it has this unique shape that it, it, and the fact that it's connected to all these sites in some sort of way um, is fantastic. Um, but also this is in the ex exhibition as well. So we're starting to learn more about this settlement and it's something that I want to talk about um, in our next class, possibly in the future of this. I think we should just do one dedicated on this area because there was so much that was being brought up. It's absolutely um, 
it's just fantastic just how well preserved it is and um, but how it's important to actually protect it and I think it'd be nice to talk about um the protection of it all as well um but it's telling us a brief overview I think it's telling us about style I think it's telling us about um how things were set out the burials is also telling us how people meant um to each other and I think this is all important as well this reconstruction here could have been off but this is what this person has taken in what they've learned from other people and this is what they're representing to us um like the fact that they're um being represented with clothes because I, I think we always see the prehistoric people in naked in some sort of way and it drives me at the wall and um, especially in this cold climate I don't think you'd want to be naked but if that's what the um the living um areas look like it's definitely fantastic um and even just seeing the iron age settlements which we will get in favor is circular so it's, it's almost like they've gone back to this stone building um as well um iron age uh, settlements as well rather than sticking to these timber halls it's, it's quite interesting to see how um this is something that we find easier to build with and possibly um to keep everything warm as well maybe a way of keeping everyone together i think it's more social when you're in a circular uh, structure and this wouldn't have been something that you would have stayed in the whole time um but again uh, i don't think we should totally listen to artists um interpretation because it can throw us off and confuse the understanding of everything so if i um get to the conclusion i realized that we finished a, a little bit earlier than what i thought we were today so uh, that, that's a change from normally uh, finishing at half eight but a lot can be learned, I think, from these kiss burials. Um, they can differ, um, they can reflect a difference in possibly the practices and the beliefs, but also what that individual could mean, maybe their status, maybe their standing in the area. Um, I think Park City, I said, like I said, is rich in archaeology, and I think it would be nice for us to do an overview, almost like going through, um, this could have been, uh, could be a two-parter where we look at the prehistoric period and possibly look at the uh, Roman period in one um lecture as well but I think it's definitely to focus on because looking at the reports that they have in Park Sibby is definitely an interesting place and very significant um, and I think Whitehorse Hill is fantastic with all this archaeology that this being found um, it's very distinctive as well um, and even just down to the horse hair bracelet I think that's absolutely gorgeous and the fact that they're able to find that as well and um, this probably would have been a delight to research and read um, and I can understand why this is considered in, as important but I also see why this one's considered important because of how well preserved and fantastic the pottery is being created I love pottery and I love looking at um, how pottery is it, it, how it is created how you can have different styles and I think it's a way of creating an identity of that area that is manufacturing this um obviously I'm looking at this from a med medieval perspective but is it a way of showing off I think all goods are a way of showing off how well your craftsmanship is in the area and people want to go and they want to have that distinctive pottery so I was thinking that as well and um, but this has been done with a lot of thought I think to the individual um and these individuals that are buried there, they obviously had this offering, whether this is to deities, whether it's for them, I still think is absolutely fantastic that we're able to find residue on that. And the settlement here is very interesting. I'd really like to go into this deeply and talk about um, this reconstruction and whether we think that we agree or not. I, I definitely wouldn't agree to everything, especially the uh, skull on the wall. I don't feel like that. I feel like that's too modern. Um, I, d I just don't see that. Um, but I think we'll definitely have a lecture on these two settlements, the one from the Iron Age and the Neolithic, because they're absolutely fantastic um, as well. Um, so I think the archaeology here is rich and we have the potential in Wales to change the perspectives, add to the perspectives, show that there's different ways, different practices in archaeology in general and how that can change in, uh, our understanding and bring it to a more wider perspective rather than a very tunneled vision uh, perspective. Um, I think it's not based on riches as well, it's based on what we're able to find. So yes, we didn't have um, horse hair bracelets or beads um, or this bear skin to uh, seal the 
kists in Wales, we have those two fantastic pots and we find out that this was a family and this was clearly an area where um, individuals would be put and it was clearly a family or a community that really cared for each other because they stayed together in their afterlife. So I thought it was absolutely fantastic looking at all this and I realised that we can learn a lot from these kiss burials um, in archaeology. So if I... Okay, I've done that. Um, So, Anne, is there anything that you'd like to ask or add? Well, it was really interesting seeing the KISS um, burials because we have KISS burials around, you know, we have found KISS burials around um, the area I live. Mm. Of course, they've all been covered over now, you know, they've all, yeah. there's data and there's, you know, reports on, on them. So, you know, they were kissed yeah. and, and they have pottery and so many um, people there, you know, and uh, it's just so nice to see those kisses in um, uh, Anglesey because um, they, they, you can see they are smaller groups, mm. you know, they like they're not doing great big uh, monuments now, you know, or where they've got yeah. a whole community building, you know, the the memorial or whatever, you know, the Neolithic, like the Neolithic. So you mm. to build these great big things, and now they're getting to more domestic sized, you know, um, yeah, normal like what what we do you know putting coffins and things so yeah that's really interesting and um yeah is it's, there's a lot I'm <laughs> so glad we got it you know yeah <laughs> I, so I think glad it's still there at the it, moment it, it, it is yeah it is but I, I think it also reflects um maybe the human understanding to possibly something more spiritual so I think it we, we definitely see how things like that develop throughout time and I think um obviously there's no text written so whereas the medieval period I could sort of talk about the development of theology based on mystics for example mm-hmm. we can't do that and I think looking at these burial practices can tell us a lot more about possibly something like that whether it's just theory and I think one thing that I like with things like that is that no one's wrong so I was possibly yeah. thinking how maybe the food it could be for some god or goddess or it could be for the individuals on their way off into their journey so they don't get hungry mm-hmm. or it could be the fact that this family prided themselves on making dairy products in the community and that's what they were remembered for and so they decided to put it in a pot we see with people's burials um people have um I, I, for example Metzka, they leave um things that are important to that family member um yeah. And so you see some funny ones. I think I always used to joke around when I was younger and say I'd have a pot noodle on my grave. And I think it's just so, it's sort of like that, isn't it? But I think yeah. that was what I was case. thinking. Yeah, I mean, I think when when someone you love dies, you 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 want to send stuff with them, you know, or, mm. or put it in the grave, you know. And um, I mean, it's, it is different now, but it should, you know, it should be allowed, really. You know, yeah. even now, and um, but it, it's it's very interesting. I, l- I love that period of time. Mm. Yeah, because uh, we're getting more modern, uh, like yeah. more like us, really. Um, and yet, it's a progress. It's a progression. Yeah, you know. Or I should say a digression. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we have a tendency turning out lately but um <laughs> yes anyway that was lovely. all right thank you Anne and um, Richard anything that you'd like to uh, ask or possibly add uh it's only that they found a kiss burial over the island <clears throat> oh when they on were the putting, Lundy yeah, Island on Barry Island oh Barry on yeah Point, yeah when I think it was about 1898 and they put a breakwater in across the harbour oh wow and they were digging there they found a, a kiss burial there yeah. and they oh. actually they dug it out and they moved it then into the ruins of St Barrack's Chapel on the oh. other side of the island. Oh. So, so it is, is it protected now or is it? Well I take it it's, yeah. you know, because there's been loads of excavations done over mm. St Barrack's Church. 
like John Story. Yeah. This was 1898 anyway, so. So it was preserved and they moved it virtually from one side of the island to the other. Yeah, you know, I, 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 fingers crossed that they did do that because I think it hurt me when they, they move it and they weren't sure what they were doing and then the next thing you know you read and it was damaged or it was broken and we lost the evidence. So, uh, I, yeah, that's fantastic, Kurt Richards. I think possibly we could get Carl onto that for our Thursday, uh, for, for our Friday classes yeah. and try and see if we could talk about that because it seems absolutely fantastic and really interesting probably curse me now when he finds out uh yeah. suggested that but it sounds really interesting I um, they already had um on the the end of the point you know it's fry's point it's been yeah tried out. and then i think they found there were about three or four tumuli on there oh wow they did find in the one they did dig out a you know an earthenware pot which had held uh you know ashes and Oh, wow, that's fantastic. I yeah, might even I, have a look on Ar Archaeologia Cambrensis because they yeah. even just put that in sometimes. Um, even if it's just very simple, you could just bring a lot from that anyway. Um, that's what I found anyway, <laughs> is yeah, it, especially it is with Welsh, Welsh archaeology. Um, for example, um, those um, pottery uh, making uh, kilns that I found in the medieval period in Wales, one was talked about quite extensively. The other two was just very brief. And so I think you've got to sort of put your own mind to it and own imagination. So I think they hopefully if I could get an image of possibly that pot that they had found there, Richard. Yeah, um, be able to get that. I've seen, yeah. on, I've seen drawings of it. And I think it's in the in Cardiff Museum, but yeah, Ooh. whether it's on show. Well, the thing is, they, they you know, we're so highly populated, yeah. so you can't yeah. leave things hanging around, lying around. And uh, I was just looking at the dinosaur footprint, you know, that was immediately kind of taken away. You know, yeah. In, yeah. In this in situ, you know, and, um, but <coughs> you just... You know, we have to try and preserve them in as best way as we can at the time, yeah. I think, you know. Yeah. And um, that's why I think it's so great that we've actually got a living, you know, a living uh, excavation, you know, going on at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Still finding. Yeah. You know, yeah. all being destroyed and built yeah, it's, on, you know. It's fantastic. They found this when they were building the breakwater and they did... Yeah, you know, it was I preserved, mean, so. yeah, yeah, because so. ours were underneath the area where the um, where they were going to build an industrial estate, similar, I suppose, to Barry. Really, they they have lots of things under the industrial estates, like the mm. Viking Cemetery and things like that. You know, but yeah. it's just so nice to find them before they get covered up. Yeah, you know, you don't know how many of these builders sort of find things and just cover it all up, you know. Yeah, yeah. they don't want the hassle of having archaeologists in. No, or, or sometimes yeah. they just simply just don't care enough. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. It, 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 is, it does frustrate me a little bit. Um, when I see sort of development in an area that I know could be significant, yeah. um. I, I know it's going off on a tangent, but there's an area closer to me. They've just had a big housing um, estate put there, and it's next to a Norman yeah. built church. But there's yeah. also discussions and um, evidence to suggest that there was a monastic settlement from the sixth century there. Yeah. Um, and I'm seeing them taking it all up, and I'm just thinking, oh, I, I would love to know whether you found anything, but I yeah. don't think they would even know. And sometimes it's, it could just be some, something simple as pottery. And if you don't have the eye for it, it could, it could just seem like rubbish, really, um, or just blend in with everything else. So it's just a shame. It does make you wonder how much archaeology has been damaged because of things like this. Mm. Um, and it's definitely the reason why uh, Park City has been one that's been of interest because of the fact that it's been urbanised quite quickly as well. Mm. And that church is lovely. You see it from the motorway. Can't you? Mm. It's got the red, white rendering or yellow rendering on it. Yeah, and um, you know, it's it could be quite a significant place. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I hope it's not completely surrounded. 
No, no. Um, it, it seems like at the moment it, they, they've sort of left that area mm. and they've started digging all around. But you never know. There could have been something nearby. Um, yeah. it, this area in Pennsylvania and Edson is quite frustrating. You see in Carl's book, the Roman one, there is a lot of, um, well, it's pottery making kiln here. There's lots of coins being found here in pots. Um, and then you have a lot of evidence of a, a a medieval church that way, a monastic settlement that way, and a, a Norman church. There's clearly something going on in this area. Um, yeah. But it's, again, it's, it's, it's developed on so fast that I think mm. you don't really have a chance to find out what it is. So yeah. it, it is a shame. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to ask somebody to do it. <laughs> yeah, definitely <laughs> go and harass them. <laughs> Thank you both anyway. Um, okay. Have a lovely evening. And I'll see you tomorrow, Anne, as yeah. well. Okay, then. Okay. Take care. All the best. Bye. 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 Um, to anyone who's watching, um, I'm Jess and this is Carl's account. Um, I'm here on every Wednesday, seven o'clock till eight. Um, if you like this and you like you like anything that Carl does, um, definitely like and subscribe and comment because it really does help us out and it helps us get more information out to people. I think a lot of people think that archaeology and history is quite boring, um, but it's not. It, 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 it's just our past and um, that's something that me and Carl aim to actually Bring attention to um so take care and um, have a lovely evening um if you're watching live with us and um 